Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about those uh, a couple of overtime games and a couple of ga games where team just escaped with a win. Very, very lucky to keep in that fight, and Alabama may be the chief among them. But let's get into a couple of top 25 games that were crazy this weekend, and they got lost in the bunch. No two ways about that, but there were a number of results that might surprise you even seeing them today, because you might have missed them on Saturday. But this is one you did not miss. Texas just dominates Oklahoma in the Red River rivalry a huge win for this team and frankly it felt a lot like the Michigan game other other than the slow start from Texas they were able to get a couple of turnovers and quick scores at the at the end of the first half and that was the end of the game pretty much end all be all Oklahoma was not scoring 20 points in this game and if you watch the game it was very unlikely they were getting to 10 but the reality is this one could have been uglier, no two ways about that. Texas probably could have pushed on their neck just a little bit more, but no need to, right? You're, you're able to get out with a win, and really more than anything else, you know, Quinn Ewers didn't start as crisp as you want. I had one turnover early on in the game, um, <clears throat> had a rushing touchdown, had a passing touchdown, so settled in pretty nicely throughout the game, but did have that early mistake, and then they just went to Trey Wisner, and he was absolutely remarkable in this game. 13 carries, 118 yards, one touchdown. I'd have to imagine that is the number one running back for Texas going forward, and just huge plays left and right, and he got bailed out a little bit. Almost had a second touchdown, but Silas Bolden kind of didn't steal that from him by any means, but saved him a little bit on that run. But Texas is one of the best teams in the country. No two ways about that. Now, we can talk about the schedule and how aggressive the opponents that they played is. I fully understand that argument, and I share that argument. Oh, but Georgia will be the first big-time test for this team. All that being said, if you watch this team, if you watch how they go about business, it's hard to find any holes. Uh, there are a couple of very, very minor holes, but the reality is if Quinn Ewers is on the field and if they're playing a team that doesn't have an elite offensive line, they're going to be fine. They're a really, really good team. For Oklahoma, this offseason is massive. They have to be able to figure out that offense. There are so many different things that have to get in place. They have to do better getting the offensive linemen that they need. They probably have to get a quarterback because as much as I love, I love Michael Hawkins, I think he's going to be a great player in time. He's just not all the way there yet, and I don't necessarily think he's going to be all the way there in 2025, so I would venture to say it's going to be a very, very different offense for Oklahoma right down to the coordinator, if I had to imagine. And then we got to get to this game, and weird. This Georgia team is just different than a lot of the Georgia teams of the past, and frankly, Carson Beck broke the uh, UGA passing record in this game with 459 yards through the air. That's all well and good. That's really fun. No two ways about that. That is not the way Georgia wants to win football games. That is not the way that they're going to win a national title, just plain and simple. Carson Beck is an incredible quarterback. I've talked about this time and again. He, at the very least to me, is a top three, top five quarterback in this country. Thing is, he should not be asked to do that much. He doesn't need to be asked to do that much in the majority of UGA games going back because they had a run game, because they had an offensive line that was going to be able to impose their will. Didn't happen in this one. They ran for 150 yards in this game. 52 of them came on an end around to Anthony Evans. 25 carries for 98 yards is just not nearly good enough for this team. So this O-line without Tate Rallage is an entirely different group, and they got a lot of stuff to figure out. No two ways about that. I do want to give some love to Michael Van Buren. He had his first two starts at Texas and at Georgia. This is a very talented kid. And at, at the in the Texas game, you saw little flashes. He was playing pretty good football, making some plays with his legs. But in this game, 20 for 37, 306 yards, three touchdowns through the air, only one INT. Really, really incredible stuff, especially when your uh, running game only gives you 79 yards to play around with. This is a very talented player. And frankly, I think Mississippi State has to feel really good about the guy they got going forward. I did see the video uh, rolling around online of, of Kirby Smart essentially shoving uh, Michael Van Buren and definitely could have gotten a lot worse if Michael Van Buren took exception to that, but definitely a terrible look. I don't think he was trying to push the kid. I think it was an accident. I think it was an aggressive accident. No two ways about that, but I do think it was an accident. Um, a very bad look. No two ways about that. Very you know good on Michael Van Buren for handling it the way that he did, but one of those things that whenever there's something around Georgia, it is going to get clipped. It is going to get torn apart on Twitter and 
Kirby definitely gave him that opportunity this past weekend. I don't think it's a huge deal by any means, but definitely something that wasn't the greatest look in the world. But for Georgia in general, they're a good team. Uh, They're a really good team, I would argue. They're not a title one, at least as of right now. They have players on that field. I think the fact that Dylan Bell is not on that field more consistently is insane to me. They got to get that O-line going. Tate Radledge pretty much has to get back. The run game has to give them more. Frankly, if this is the team that shows up to Austin, Texas in in a week's time, they're going to get torn to pieces. They're going to get done to them the exact same thing that was done to Michigan, the exact same thing that was done to Oklahoma. They might be able to score a couple of more points on Texas, but the reality is you're not keeping up with this offense if you're uh, if you're putting out that defensive performance on Saturday, just plain simple. And then we got this Iowa State team. They just keep plugging along, keep playing really, really good football over there in the Big 12, and we'll get to the other team that's doing just that here in a second, but a really, really good team. It was one of those games that, at halftime, it was a little bit sketchy. There was a close game here in West Virginia. It looked like they had some fight in them on Coal Miner Day. It was incredible to watch all of that. The Coal Miners leading them out, out of the tunnel was a really special moment. No two ways about that. But coming out of halftime, uh, Iowa State forced two INTs, had two 10-play uh, touchdown drives. They just really buried West Virginia towards the uh, early parts of the second half. Huge shout-out to Carson Hansen, another running back that's popping up for Iowa State. 20 carries, 196 yards, three touchdowns. They've now had three different guys that have been their running back one at any given point this year, and they've all produced at a ridiculously high level. So huge shout-out to that offensive line because they're open big-time holes. And then I said last week that West Virginia was going to run uh, need to run for at least 200 yards to get this one done. They ran for 150, and they threw 32 passes to 31 rushes, and Iowa State got two picks was never going to be a winning formula for West Virginia if they were throwing more passes than they were running and couldn't get anything going running. So that's the reality of that game. Kind of the read that I had on it going in, and that's what happened. But Iowa State continues to be one of the most consistent commodities in a conference that is the furthest thing from consistent. So really impressive stuff. They're playing UCF at home, which doesn't look nearly as scary as it did to start the season. And then they got a bye before Texas Tech. That is going to be the game that a lot of things are going to be defined in this uh, conference. So definitely watch out for that one. But Iowa State keeps rolling along and maybe proving some people wrong in the process. And then we got to talk about BYU, the other team in the Big 12 that is rolling right along. I was very wrong about this uh, about this team in general, but about this game, I thought Arizona State was going to be able, or Arizona was going to be able to pull one of those Big Twelve moments. A team that has really no business winning on the road at another team was going to be able to get it done. Didn't even remotely happen. There wasn't even a chance of that this happening. If that uh, if you watch this game go down, there were so many different things that uh, BYU did on the defensive side of the ball to make life tough for Arizona. Won the turnover battle four to one. They were incredible. Absolutely awesome. Only got 3.7 yards per carry for Arizona. Never trailed in this game after they tied it in seven. It was domination from BYU pretty much from start to finish. Jake Retzlaff continues to execute at a really high level. 18 for 32, 218, two, uh, two touchdowns, no turnovers. That's all you need. If you have that defense on the other side, you are going to be more than fine. Uh, just playing uh, mistake-free football, playing defense, and really just suffocating teams at the end of the day. And... That is about it for Arizona this year. You know, it was a team that coming in, you had some worries about the coaching changes, about a couple of the players leaving, but you did feel like Noah Fafita and T-Mac are in that room. They have a shot, but it came up a little bit short, and it was proven over the last couple of weeks that as good as T-Mac is, you can't just funnel the ball to him, and you have to have more guys that scare teams in. They just didn't really have those guys. So a tough year for Arizona. Obviously still plenty to play for going forward. Establish yourself in this conference. Play really good football. But at the end of the day, any chance of a Big 12 title, probably out the door for Arizona if I had to imagine. Pitt survives again. I cannot believe this team keeps getting away with wins here, but they do. They, they played really, really in- interesting football, won a ton of different ways, and this one didn't really have Eli Holstein. Did not play a good game at all, only had 50% completion, two picks in this game. It was all about the defense, and then it was all about Desmond Reed. This is one of the most remarkable players in the ACC this year. 50, or 16 carries, 120 yards, two touchdowns, 72-yard touchdown run. This guy was awesome, and he's been awesome for quite some time over there at Pitt, so if you're looking to watch anyone in the ACC right about now, 
Desmond Reed might be where you want to start. He's absolutely remarkable, and him and Eli Holstein are becoming one of the better uh, backfield duos in the entire conference. But ACC is, or excuse me, Cal has lost three ACC games. One to Florida State, where they just couldn't get much going offensively, but did miss two field goals. They lost a game to Miami, where they gave up a 25 point lead, had some ref stuff that made that one sting a little bit more, and then in Pitt, you missed a 40 yard field goal with a chance to win. So. Just a really tough stretch for this team. I think they're doing an incredible job. Cannot say enough good things about Justin Wilcox and the job that he's doing over there. But at the end of the day, losing those games, it feels a lot worse. So it's one of those things that I think they're going to be able to build into a really fun program out there and be dangerous going forward. But you missed the mark a couple of times this year. And at this point, it's probably too much of a hill to climb. But as for Pitt, they're going to be a really, really tough team to beat. They're getting into the tough part of their schedule. They got SMU, Cal, or Clemson at uh, Louisville coming up on their schedule. So it's not going to be easy by any means. But if Eli Holstein can get back on track and stay upright, can play really good football, this team can do a lot of really fun things this year. No two ways about that. I would probably venture to say they're going to lose those games. But who knows? Very talented team that can put up points with just about anyone in the country. And then we got to talk about this one. I don't know how this happened, frankly, because I didn't know Illinois was capable of putting up 50. I didn't definitely didn't know that Purdue was capable of putting up 49. But here we are. Uh, I talked briefly about this game last week and just said, I don't think Illinois is going to lose. It's one of those games that inexplicably Illinois will lose and kind of uh, ruin a lot of the momentum they've had. And they didn't. They were able to avoid it by the skin of their teeth. And it was a very, very crazy game. Ryan Brown, the uh, quarterback that came in for Purdue for Hudson Card, who went down injured last week, 18 for 26, 297 yards, three touchdowns through the air. He also had 17 carries, 118 yards on the ground. He was their offense. It was absolutely remarkable in a game where you're playing a pretty good defense, thrust into action. He's doing awesome stuff. It's absolutely incredible to watch that kid, and maybe he can get a little bit going for Purdue. Maybe he shocks the world on Friday night and beats Oregon, but we'll get there when we get there. Illinois stays alive in this uh, Big Ten race. Obviously, plenty to go for them, and feels like a team that's probably going to stumble once more. Michigan comes to town this upcoming weekend. They get that one, then a lot of things happen very quickly. Illinois is not necessarily a team that is a fun little uh, early season story. They are then a real team. They could possibly make a CFP run. Obviously got to deal with Michigan, but this is a team that definitely can. It's going to be really awesome to watch that. Huge bounce back from Illinois from the, uh, in, in some crazy circumstances down the stretch of this one. Great fight from Purdue. No two ways about that. And hopefully the offense is slowly finding itself. But as of right now, Illinois just got enough. They just got enough. They're able to stay alive. And at the end of the day, in a crazy world of college football right about now, that's plenty if, as far as I'm concerned. But let's take our final break here. And when we come back, we're going to talk about just all the other games we didn't get a chance to get to. Utah got upset all the way back on Friday. Feels like it was a million years ago. We also had um, Louisville knock off another undefeated this weekend. And uh, Vanderbilt continue the run that we absolutely love to watch. So we'll get to all that right after this. So stick with us.